I'm just gonna <clears throat> talk about a little something I got from Algae Barn, as you know, from my last video. By the way, before we get started, don't forget to check the video description for links to everything I use, pretty much everything I use, in my aquarium. Crazy Freddy, what's up, dude? Happy weekend. I barely made it to the weekend. So this is a live stream for those of you watching the videotaped portion. Videotape, yeah, because we're in the 80s. 80s are the best. Hey, get away from there. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? I'm just going to talk about the product I got from the Algae Barn. You guys are starting to chat with each other on screen. That's cool. That's great. It's a great community. I'm not going to be reading them as much because I'm focusing on the tank and focusing on the video. Um, but I usually like to stream most Saturday mornings lately because it gives you guys a chance to chat with each other and make it more of a community. Speaking about community, don't forget to check the video description for a link to the Facebook club. Lots of people joining more and more every day. It's great. People are posting questions. People are helping each other. People are posting photos and videos of their tanks. It's really awesome. I'm proud to have that. And I'm very happy that you guys want to be part of the channel. So thanks. Um, also, don't forget to check the video description because I put links to pretty much everything I use in my aquarium here. So if you want to know more, you can click on it. Pretty much, for the most part, everything's on Amazon. Crazy Freddy. One more outburst like that, you're out of the club. All right. So, you guys know that I got an order from the LG, not the LG Barn, but LG Barn. And these guys are really cool. Um, Sean has been completely great. He's subscribed to the channel. Thank you, Sean. And LGBarn.com, they sell, you know, inverts and mainly fish for your, I mean, sorry, food for your fish. I started looking at the comments coming on the screen. They sell food for your um, mandarin, your fish, basically copepods, and uh, chieto if you're building a refugium. Really check them out. I'm not getting paid to say this. I pay for all my stuff. But uh, hey, if people want to sponsor me, that would be great. Um, Sean, thank you so much for the extra little gift in the box. He gave me this red orgo. I can't pronounce what's in parentheses. Gracilaria parvispora aquacultured golf ball. He said he saw the video of my tangs and he loves them. I do too. I know you guys do as well. This, by the way, is, is as aggressive as my fish get. They always swim, usually together in a school, and they just like to chill out. I love these guys. 125 gallon salt water tank, six feet long. And um, it's a great tank. I will be getting some more coral in here. But what I recently did was I placed an order from Algae Barn for 5,200. I believe it's 5,280. I don't know if Sean sits there and counts all the copepods before delivering them. But we'll take their word for it. 5,280 per bag. I had got two bags. And I believe if you sign up now, your first time customer, they give you a duplicate order. I think that's still going on. So I got the two bags. So a little over 10,000 copepods. Those are those little tiny white bugs that you see scampering all over your sand and rock and glass. If you have a mandarin goby, they eat them and that's all they eat. Hey, all right. Leia's joined the show. What are you doing? <laughs> okay. All right, back to this. So he saw my tangs. He liked them a lot. So he included some red orgo. And it's hard to see. It's kind of dark here. But it looks like it comes in the water. And uh, yes, I know I need a purple tang. They're expensive. I really want one. I think I'm going to get one. So I got five tangs in here, and I kind of overstocked my tank, but you know what? When you look at it, they've got enough swimming room. They're pretty calm. They're good. They're good guys. 
plus I don't have much rock work, plus I do not have rock against the glass. So that allows for water flow in between the rocks and behind. So that's what I really like. I might, I'd like to build it up higher to be honest, but uh, at this point, the way I've got it set up, I'd have to kind of tear this down or else it would be a balancing act. So let's feed the fish, the red orgo. I've never used this stuff before. And, uh, you know, we'll see. I'm sure they're going to go nuts for it. Sean says his tangs do. Let me turn down the Vortec. I like to turn off all the power heads when I feed them. I gotta get another outlet strip. I have to get another outlet strip with the switches for the individual outlets. It comes in handy because the power heads over here, I'm constantly pulling the plug out. See what they wanna eat. Hi. You know what I'm going to be doing too? I'm going to be building a pod condo. Maybe today. I'm going to spend some time today and I'm going to um, brush off the remaining green algae from the rock. There's not much. I'm going to do a little vacuuming to my water change. Got to take both protein skimmers out and I got to clean those. Um, so I'm going to rely on the copepods to do the detritus clean up and help with the tank on that front so let's give these guys a little bit of this So if they float around, they'll find it, they'll get it. I'm gonna give a little bit of Rod's food, nori as well, seaweed. They love this, they're used to this. Fox face is over there. He's eating that red orgo stuff from algae barn. And I'll feed them later for real. You know what I've been doing? Yeah, you know what, Rod's food. Hey, Hydro guy, what's up? Rod's food has a little bit of the garlic in it the nori and they love it so what I'm gonna do too is I'm gonna be building I'll show you guys a pod condo for the copepods and I'm probably gonna use a three inch clear PVC tube that I use to build my rotter tubes that you guys have bought thank you I've got a few more orders recently thank you very much if you're interested in those there's a link in all the video descriptions for the videos I'm going to use a 3 inch clear PVC, I'm going to put some chieto in it, not much, I'm just going to submerge it 
in the back of the tank over here behind the rock with some holes in it, little cap on it. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna provide a home, a haven for the copepods to live and reproduce and seek refuge and kind of chill out and live safely. And then they'll make their way out of their condo and get eaten by the fish. Um, so that'll help the breeding and that'll be cool. A lot of people have used like Tupperware containers turned upside down. I want to try and make it look a little nicer. Not that I care too much, but I want to make it more like a thing, a transparent thing that looks like it's part of the tank. I don't want to have just like a, a plastic white Tupperware bowl in there. But you can do whatever you want. You know, you could even use like a Dixie cup or something plastic upside down, poke some holes in it, whatever. So, but like for the most part, your copepods, they're going to multiply and breed within the rock. I got my copepods. You can get them at any reef store for the most part, but I got them from Algae Barn. There's a link in the description, algebarn.com. You know, pretty good pricing. Pods are usually a little expensive, but you put them in there. You put them in at night so the fish don't get them. The lights are out. Turn off your protein skimmers. Give them a chance to settle. I turn my protein skimmers on in the morning, and they all hide within the rock and the sand and everywhere. In the next coming days or couple of weeks, I expect to see them on the glass and the rocks a lot. I seeded my tank with copepods your tanks all have copepods in them but especially if you have a mandarin goby like me that's all the mandarins eat and they go through thousands of copepods a day easily so i wanted to reseed my tank because i haven't seen them on the glass or the rocks i know they're in there but i just i went from seeing them everywhere the overflows everywhere to absolutely nowhere um i just i'm just not seeing them i had a lot of them living in this rock here i would put a flashlight in there before i started filming today um lots of copepods in there just hundreds and hundreds of them i didn't see any in there so you know i put copepods in here and i seeded it weeks before i put the mandarin in the mandarin is still doing really well and i've had him for over a year now so he's eating something but it, it's just time to reseed the tank. So I put over 10,000 copepods in. The first time I put 5,000 in. And uh, thanks again to Sean from Algae Barn. I highly recommend Algae Barn. I may go on the um, auto shipment. They send you a shipment of whatever you want every two months. So I might do that, try it out. Yeah, Hydro Guy, good point. He just said that he wanted to get some off of eBay or other places for, you know, to save some cash. Great idea, although, like you said, really bad idea. You don't know who, where that's coming from. You don't know what's in that water. If there's ick or marine velvet parasite in that water, you're going to doom your tank and you could kill your fish. I don't trust it. I make all my water here. I don't get anything from any reef store except fish, and then I quarantine them before I put them in. This tank is completely ick-free. I've had no issues. People say that once ick, which is a deadly parasite, once it's in your tank, it's always in your tank. That's completely false. Um, it doesn't come in unless you allow it in. That's why I don't let anything in my tank without quarantining it. This includes corals. Here's something that people have been asking. If ick parasite does not live on coral, and how does coral bring it into your tank? Well, you go to the store and you buy a piece of coral. It's not actually the coral that brings it into your tank. It's the water that the fish that the coral comes in on. That bag that they put the coral in, it's got water in it. You take the coral out, you put it in your tank, there you go. It just takes one drop of water with a ick parasite in it and you're done. Ick multiplies rapidly. So I quarantine all fish and all corals before putting anything in my tank. By the way, I also wrote a book on Amazon. It's a few bucks. It's like over 40 pages. It tells you how to treat ick, how to prevent it from ever coming into your tank. Again, there's a link to that 
below in all video descriptions. So these fish are doing really well. I'm looking forward to getting more coral in here. And I just, I'm loving the tank again. I mean, I had that algae outbreak, um, green hair algae, that's cleaning up well. Yes, you're right, it can also hide in the frag plug. So you know what I do? I have two quarantine tanks ready to go. I've got a 40 gallon one, which I haven't used yet. I've got a 20 gallon one which I use for new fish and I dose it with half the dose of copper. Copper solution can be very deadly to your fish. That's why I dose half a dose, the recommended dose from Seachem Coopermain. And um, keep that guy in there for four weeks before putting him in the tank. Five weeks actually minimum, five to six weeks. Then the new fish goes in. For coral, I have a small five gallon tank that I keep. No copper solution because copper kills inverts like your shrimp and snails and corals instantly. So I keep a separate tank that's just salt water when I buy inverts and corals and I keep those in there for five to six weeks before putting them in this tank. Don't rush anything. I know you're excited and you think, oh, it won't happen to me, but it does. So that's the deal. Uh, what kind of coral am I going to get? I don't know. I really want to get I like stuff with a lot of movement. I love my star polyps and I love my frog spawn and I love my Duncan coral. I like stuff with movement. Um, but, and I've got my zoanthid colony here I got as a little tiny plug and it grew rapidly on the rock. Um, I wanna get some colorful, um, yes, Xenia. You know what, I've tried Xenia three times and it always dies in my tank for some reason. People can't control the Xenia population. But for me, it dies right away. You know what? I tried hammer coral as well, and it dies right away. I don't know what to do. Not right away, but within a few weeks. I don't know why, but I love the hammer coral. I think I'm going to give the hammer coral another go. Um, the Xenia, too. What I'm going to do after the year, the first of the year after I get my taxes back, I'll probably get some Xenia. I will get a hammer, and I want to get maybe really colorful zoanthid not red because i have the coralline algae the purple on the rock so i want something that's going to contrast that like a bright orange or something like that would be pretty sweet so i want to get them all at the same time so i can quarantine them at the same time bronx reefer said my star polyps are going to take over the whole tank eventually. Yeah, you know what? I got this star polyp as a little frag. I recently gave the frag to my brother for his 75-gallon tank. And when I switched to Red Sea Coral Pro Salt, this took off. All my corals kind of did. And then when I got my T5 light, They took off a little more, but I really want to say, I think it's attributed mainly to the Red Sea Coral Pro Salt. So how do you prevent that coral from spreading? Well, you don't have rocks connecting because it will go up the rock. These corals are still waking up. They're usually much larger than that, but I turned the light on a half an hour ago. So I was having a hard time with the star polyps growing, but as you can see, they're really full and it's growing up this rock. Then I moved the plug over to this rock and it grew within a couple months to this. Now it's going up and behind. So I'll have to I don't know, it's going to go, go on to this rock, which I don't mind. But what I'm probably going to do is this. Before I started filming today, I'm thinking I might want to get rid of this bridge and put it somewhere else to separate these groups of rocks from these rocks. The side, so it's like a, a huge star polyp colony. What do you guys think of that? That way it leaves an opening for the fish to swim through, even though they like swimming underneath it. 
and then this side will be my coral. I think that's a good plan. I'm going to do that today. Hydro guy asks how many clowns are in the tank. I had six. Um, one passed away. They were never aggressive. Right now I've got five. Let me see if I can show you those guys. I've got a pair of Ocellaris. Here's the Picassos. There's one Ocellaris up there. He's he's from my other tank. His tank mate is over here. He's chilling out with one of the snow this my snowflake clown. Everybody gets along. You know, everybody says, don't put more than two clowns in your tank. But I've had luck with it. And I think that's because it's a six foot long tank. They can retreat to their own ends. They can visit each other as needed. And they can also retreat as needed. So if there's aggression, they do go across the tank. I've seen a couple times where they just wanted to be alone and they'll go to their other sides. They might swim just in this area over here, but they don't move. Lately, well, more times than not, they're all through the whole tank just chilling out together. Well, what size is your tank, Hydro Guy? What size is your tank? How many gallons? How long is it? Because that's going to be a factor. Um, some people have said that they've got a 55-gallon tank and they've got two pairs of clowns and things are fine, but it's always a risk. It's always a risk. Um, there was some aggression when I put my... There, there was some aggression between two of the Picassos, but now they're getting along great. It only lasted about a week. Now everyone's cool. And sometimes it's odd man out. And there's an odd amount. There's five, but it's fine. You have a 30-gallon, and you want to go to a 50. I did have six clowns in my JBJ45, which I sold. So I had six clowns in a 45-gallon tank, but I bought them all at the same time. That's a factor, too. If you buy them all at the same time, you'll have less aggression. So I would introduce all of them once you get the larger tank unless you buy them all at the same time but it doesn't sound like you've got sounds like you've got at least one pair now if they're pretty gentle and not aggressive you should be fine but again you can never tell so i'll leave that up to you i took the chance they're not cheap but i bought i saved up and i got four picassos at once plus the place i went to had a sale on them and i got kind of lucky So that's it. I'm gonna clean this tank. I'm gonna clean both protein skimmers. Justin asks if I'm gonna get any more tang fish. Um, yes, I want to get another tang fish. And, and uh, I mean, this tank, people say you should only get like one large tang for the size tank I've got. I've got one, two, three, four, five tangs, as you can see and five clownfish, and a mandarin, but he doesn't count because he's tiny. And they're doing great. I don't feel that this tank is stuffed yet. I would like to get a larger tank, but I'd love to get a purple tang. I don't think I'm going to get a blue tang. I just don't have the best of luck with them, even though I really, really love them. Um, and with ick control, I can take care of that, no problem, but I really want to get a purple tang. I'll probably save up for that guy, probably with my tax money. Unless someone out there wants to donate, I'll put your name on every video of every channel. 
Um, what was the other question? Someone asked, the, oh yeah, what's my salinity? Salinity is 1.025. I like to keep it at 1.025, 1.026 at the most. 1.026 is the ocean salinity level. Corals love the higher salinity like that. The fish can deal with it fine. If this was only a fish tank, no corals, I'd be at 1.018. Fish love the 1.018. Um, also, the lower your salinity, the more oxygen there is in the water, which is why I would keep it 1.018. Good question, because in my quarantine tank, I keep it at 1.018, because there's only fish in there. So right now, I think the salinity is 1.025. It's another reason to have a protein skimmer. Protein skimmers oxygenate the water, and I have two of them. You want to have oxygen in that water. So by having some kind of a bubbler or even having your water trickle out over some kind of drip tray or something, or just have some, you know, an air stone in your sump maybe, or just use your protein skimmer. You'll oxygenate the water. The fish will be healthier for it, and your corals will be fine because your salinity is higher. Hydro guy, how did I get into salt water? That's a good question. You know what? Um, when I was in high school years ago, I had a five-gallon freshwater tank with cichlids, you know, because you got to have a, a, a freshwater tank. Everyone kind of did. And that stopped after a few years. It was fun, but it was just kind of there, you know, just kind of blah, whatever. Years and years went by, and I had kids. And we would go to PetSmart to get, like, treats and stuff for the dogs. And my kids, who were very tiny, would always go to the fish tanks and look at the fish. Can we get a fish? So I got a small five gallon. Long story short, it just wasn't fun. They lost interest. And I got a JBJ28 to make it more exciting. And it was a little more exciting for them, but it still kind of bored me. And I thought, what about salt water? So I started doing YouTube searches on salt water and I heard it was a lot of work and a lot of money. And it, it is once, until you get to that point where things are kind of stabilized. So I turned it into a saltwater tank. My kids really like it, and I love it so much more than fresh water. Nothing against fresh water, but salt water is just so much better. The fish are intelligent. It's just night and day difference. I went to a 75-gallon. I outgrew that in a year, and then I went to the 125-gallon. So what turned into a little project for my kids warped into maybe I'll try salt water, and the rest is history. And then I started a YouTube channel not really wanting to. I just did it to share some information and ask questions, and it just kind of grew. I started to put a lot of hard work into it, and now we have the community that we do today, and it's a lot of fun. I made a lot of cool friends, and you guys watch the videos. I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. I watch this more than TV. I don't ever watch TV. So I'd like to read how you guys got started in the hobby, so put that in the comments. I've never had a dwarf angel, and I've never tried the gyre, um, CJ, I, he wanted one for the longest time from CJ's Aquariums, and he finally got one, this is a couple years ago now already, and, man, time's flying, and he had issues with it, and a lot of people were complaining that the, the gyres were breaking, so I never tried one, but they look great. But I never tried one. So I'm using an MP40 on one end. My other MP40 broke. So I got to send that in and spend a little cash because it's out of warranty. So I'll have two MP40s again. But right now I got a high door power head, an MP40 power head, and a second high door hidden over here just to help with the flow to bounce off the glass in the back.
I wanted to show you guys. Look at this. Remember when she was a little puppy? Yeah, not anymore. Not anymore. Let me see these teeth. Let me see them. I love those teeth. I love those teeth. <laughs> This is, this is a solid babe. A solid babe. Arr. Merry Christmas, by the way. So, but, I don't know. I'm going to move the rock today and spend some time cleaning this. Finally, I got a little more free time. I've been doing a lot of video editing for clients. So, finally, I've got, like, more free day. I haven't had that in weeks. I don't have any reptiles. Oh my God, it's CJ. I was just talking about you, man. Someone asked about CJ. It's good to see you, man. Um, someone asked about the gyre and if I have one. And I said that you had one, but you had problems with it. Uh, a lot of people had problems with the gyre. Is that true? Um, and do you have one now? I can't remember. Do you like it? Okay, so you love them. I know you love them. But I remember you saved up and you got one. Oh, it's an older controller. So, CJ, if someone gets a gyre now, will they be okay? Was there, was there like, an issue? Uh, he says there's, there was a problem with the first-generation controller. So you like them. You recommend them. Okay, cool. He said they're legit now. Um, that's awesome. Good. Because you know what I'd like to do is I'd like to put one on the back of the tank. Right? That would look good, right? Because before you popped in, CJ, I said I've got an MP40 with a little high door unit to bounce off the glass. And I've got another high door over here to bounce off the glass. That's all I've got for power heads. Um, my second MP40 broke. i got to send that in. But if I put a high door in the back at the top here, that would be cool to take care of the flow in the back of the tank and everything. That would really, really be good, I think. So I'll look at getting one of those in the new year with the tax money. Yeah, you know what? That's a good point. Um, Okay, yeah, let's talk about that just really quick. Gyre works best long ways. What do you mean? So you mean put it at the side of the tank? I thought if I put it here, it goes like this, and it... Would that be good? I don't know. I'll have to read up on it. Um, yes, if you get tangs, some can be aggressive. You, that's why I've got a mix. I don't have two yellows. Um, all these guys are really sweet, although my yellow tang is really sweet. When I put fish in after him, he didn't go after them at all. So I got lucky with that guy. Um, technically, you should put a yellow tang in last. There's ways around that if you don't put him in last, but you should put a yellow tang in last. They say that if you don't, there's going to be aggression. But to get around that, you can change around some of your rocks. So Gary asked how to complete the cycle a little faster on a tank, like you're starting a tank. Now, I've got videos on this, and basically for you new people out there, cycling your tank means your tank has to cycle before you put any fish in it. Because if you bought, let's say you bought this today, brand new, and you put one fish in there, the fish is going to go pee, and that's ammonia, and it's going to kill the fish because it's breathing in ammonia. What basically kills the ammonia in the water is bacteria. You've got to have bacteria in this tank. That's called cycling the tank. I've got videos on that, so that's what that is. Well, what you can do is just wait Put some shrimp in there from the butcher, let it rot and decay. Bacteria will form and it'll grow. But if you're talking about doing it faster, there's things you can buy in a bottle. But I don't rely on that. I like to rely on biology and mother nature. 
So what I do, if you have access to someone with a tank that doesn't have any parasites in it, or if you have a second tank, you can take something out of your sump below and you can put it in your other tank because that stuff is going to be filled with bacteria. Like, for example, filtration. We use sponges. You could take a sponge that's been sitting in your sump for a month and you could just put it in your other tank. It'll cycle your tank pretty much instantly. Now, that's what I did with my JBJ45 when I had that as a second tank. I knew I was going to buy it and I had a, a sponge sump for two months soaking up and having that bacteria colonize the ammonia levels in the tank were off the chart and i was doing water changes daily to get the ammonia out of there as soon as i put that sponge in there i did a water test literally the ammonia was non-existent like in less than an hour so if it's your first tank you're gonna have to use something out of the bottle or just do the best approach and wait don't rush it. There's no reason to rush the hobby because this is a really delicate balance of nature. And if you rush things, it can get out of control really quick. Go slow. That's what she said. Man, there hasn't been a good that's what she said in a while. Well, there you go. Yeah, so once I'm done with this, yep, patience is the key, and let it cycle for two months, and just just shop for all your other supplies, just like what was said just now. That's what I did, and then the key is, once you do a test and the ammonia is zero, put one fish in, because then that tank is going to stabilize and calibrate itself for the one fish. Don't put a bunch of fish in because remember the ammonia level has been destroyed that the shrimp was reproducing, the dead shrimp that you get from the butcher. And then if you put a lot of fish in, there's going to be a lot of urine and the tank can't handle that urine load, that ammonia load. You got to go slow. So I'd say one fish per month roughly i made that mistake when i got into the hobby i was buying a fish every other day it seems for my 28 gallon small fish you know and they didn't die but i got lucky because so i was doing water changes of five gallons once a week yes that's a long answer to your question take it slow For some reason, I'm kind of in the mood to work on the tank today. Sometimes I'm not. Mostly I am. I got a lot of work to do today. I'm going to clean both protein skimmers because they've got sludge in them. It's got that mulm from carbon dosing, from adding the sugar. I haven't sugar dosed in two weeks. I stopped using the Red Sea no pox. Once my algae, green hair algae, problem is completely gone and it's close to being completely gone i'm going to try the red sea no pox again to see if that comes back that's going to be my test because that and I've, I've been reading on forums that a lot of people using the red sea no pox to lower their nitrates and phosphates they had a green hair algae breakout green algae on the glass it wasn't good and I remember one phrase that one guy said, don't believe everything you read and don't believe everything that no, uh, that Red Sea tells you, even though I love their products. So once it's out of control, I'm going to see if I can get it to come back by dosing the same amount, which was per their instructions on the bottle. So I don't know what my nitrates are right now. I haven't dosed anything in two weeks. Um, I'm not using any filtration except one rotter tube underneath, and I have two protein skimmers. That's it. No, I've never had one of those corals. A, a non-photosynthetic, did you say? Nope. The only coral I've had are the ones in here. The star polyp. Oh, look. Hold on. The mandarin's out. Let me see if I can get them. Damn it. Every time I approach the tank, he hides. 
trying to catch Bigfoot with that guy. Um, the star polyps. The Duncan coral. Zoanthids. The frogs. But let me get a close up. Yeah, Rich, that dude, he's like, I, I thought I saw him flick me off. That, you know what? That's the things I get for taking care of him and just buying a bunch of copepods for him. Oh, yeah, you saw the review. That's uh, cool. So here's um, Frog Spawn. That's the first one that really wanted me to get into the hobby. Star Polyps are my favorite. I've got another frog spawn. Zoanthid. Um, what size is this? The tank is 125 gallon, six feet long. That frog spawn broke off. It used to be part of that. It's like 10 inches long. Yeah, the star polyps are my favorite. This used to be one little plug that I got for like $18, and it spread. This rock is going to be moved to here later, so this is going to be wide open so it doesn't spread anymore to any more rock. See that guy? Lawnmower Blenny. For lighting, I have an aggro bright that I got from Amazon, and I got the bulbs from Bulk Grief Supply, the ATIs, I love them. And I built this stand out of lead pipe, gas pipe, I got a video on that. The tank looks a lot better than what this video is showing. I love this Naso tank. There's so much detail to him. Yeah, I'll show you guys the sump. Oh, let me get down here. I'm getting old. Like I said, I have a rotter tube, but I'm not... I'm cleaning it now. I took it out, so... I don't know, CJ. I might do a leather coral. I'm not sure. I gotta read up on those. Okay, so here's my first sump. Yeah, easy to keep ones. I'm not too much into coral. I love coral, but I don't want to spend a lot of time with it so my rotter tube normally connects right here right now I've got I'm cleaning that and I've got the water blasting through so it's oxygenating the water really well look at all this nasty stuff I gotta clean off that's the remnants from when I started dosing the Red Sea no pox that spiderweb garbage it's nasty and it feels like snot so I've got my e-shops, my lawnmower blend, he's pretty good at eating algae. He eats it off the glass. He doesn't eat green hair algae. So this is, I think, a 20-gallon sump. It's small. Basically, it just houses my protein skimmer, and that's it. Here's a e-shops S200 protein skimmer. That's all I've got. That's all I've got. Gary, what's my opinion on the best salt for a reef tank? That's going to be up to you. I used Instant Ocean for a long time, and I just switched to Red Sea Coral Pro. I love Red Sea Coral Pro, and that's what I'm going to use. My corals have more color. They're more lively. Um, the water, to me, is a little clearer. Instant Ocean is awesome. I like the Red Sea, and I'm willing to spend a little more money for it.
I've had both Lawnmower Blunny and a Diamond Back Gobi, and they both do the same as far as cleaning up the algae. So it's, I don't know, my opinion, whatever you like more. So I've got the protein skimmer. The water comes in, goes through my rotter tube, which is out right now. So basically just goes to the protein skimmer and then it just goes into the last chamber. There is no foam block or anything. It's kind of difficult for me to reach back there because, you know, it's pushed over to the right because I drilled into this, I connected a PVC, joining a DIY second sump, a Rubbermaid container, and I've got a second beast protein skimmer. There's no filtration over here. It just comes right out the overflow into here. So, you know, some people say that you should have filtration all the way, and I did that a lot, and I caught a lot of the garbage, but other people say that it's good to have no filtration because the stuff goes back into your tank and feeds your coral and everything. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing now. Basically, one rotter tube on this side. But pretty much just the water comes through, it gets skimmed, and it goes right back into the tank. And as you can see, I don't have any issue with water bubbles. The lights from the Christmas tree are, make it difficult to see. I don't have any issue with water bubbles. It's clear. People usually use foam blocks. But you know what? If you don't wash those things to filter your water, they're just nitrate factories. Someone asked what bulbs do I have that I get from Bulk Reef Supply. Sorry for blinding you. I have two of the actinic, the blue. I've got one coral light, which is the white. And I've got one purple. I kind of want to make it three blues and get rid of the purple just to see what it would look like. Because I like tanks that look a little more blue. Uh, protein skimmer, that's going to be up to you. There's a lot of good ones out there. Um, and it's going to depend on what your price point is um, so start out with the price what can you afford just because it's more expensive doesn't mean it's better reef octopus is really good but um, there's one brand that I really like that's not that expensive I can't remember the name of it my brother's got it and I almost went with it I just can't remember the name I love eShops Yeah, the split sump is good. Adding a second sump adds to the water volume of the tank, which dilutes things. And it also allows me to put a second protein skimmer in. Because with all these fish, um, I'm pulling a lot of sludge out of the water. And a second protein skimmer, it's amazing how much more you get out of the water with two protein skimmers, I'm telling you. So I'm going to keep this. I, I, I'd rather have this split sump DIY design than a larger sump. I like my two protein skimmers. Um, so getting back to the protein skimmer, um, I like eShops. Get what you can afford, but here's the key. As you know, get a protein skimmer that is gonna take, uh, that's gonna be able to handle double the workload of what your tank is. So if you get a, let's say you got a 100 gallon aquarium and you don't wanna get a protein skimmer that's rated for a 100 gallon aquarium, you want to get one that's rated for at least half that. So get one rated for 150 gallon aquarium. Hey Johnny, what's up? So I like to double it. So if you have a 100 gallon aquarium, get a protein skimmer that's rated for a 200 gallon aquarium. That way it's going to skim a lot better. Plus if you ever upgrade to a 200 gallon aquarium, you'll be set. So do it that way. Read reviews, double your tank size skimming power. Um, so my, this is a 125 gallon tank. My eShops is rated at a 200 gallon tank. So I'm fine with the eShops. But then this one over here is rated for a 300 gallon. 
So I've got enough skimming power for a 500 gallon setup. So it's skimming like crazy off of 125. Triple's fine. No, you're not gonna hurt anything if you triple it. I mean, I've got more than triple now. I've got 500 gallons rating for skimming power and I got a 125 gallon tank. With all the rock and everything, probably 100 gallons. So, yeah, it's fine. I'm five times what I need. But I also have a lot of fish. And I'm cutting off the nasties in the water where they start. They go to the bathroom. There's uneaten fish food. So if you can skim that nasty microscopic stuff out of the water before it gets a chance to break down, you are ahead of the game. That's why I'm not relying on filtration as much as I am the protein skimming. And I added the copepods in there the other day to break down the food and also act as a food source for the fish in my mandarin. So I'm trying to start out at the source of things. Yes, that's the one. Bubble Magnus Curve 5. That's what my brother has. I really like the Bubble Magnus. I like how it's really easy to take the cup off the protein skimmer. You just lift it off. It's got like a seal on it. You don't have to twist it. I like that design a lot. Bubble Magnus is really good, and I almost bought one, but I went with my second one instead. Um... Do I wet skim or dry skim? Kind of in the middle of both. It's it, I do in the middle of both. The uh, eShop skimmer is doing more of a dry skim. The Bubble Magnus is doing more of a wet skim. I empty my skimmer cups once a week. And the reason why I don't do like a wet skim is because sometimes the skimmer goes a little crazier than other times. And if I'm not home to catch that, I don't want it to overflow. That's why I turned it down a little bit. All my fish are from the LFS. Someone asked another question. Do I use filter floss in my sump? I don't. I used to. I don't use anything anymore. Let me see if I have. No, nope. I don't have any foam. I used to have disposable foam that I loved. I don't, I don't use anything anymore. It's just my protein skimmer and my rotter tube, the one rotter tube on the side. That's all I use. Very little mechanical filtration. Justin asked, how come I don't use filter floss? I love filter floss. I would put it in there and I would throw it away every three days and cut a new piece and throw it away. That's what my rotter tube is mainly used for. There's filter floss slash foam in my one rotter tube. It's basically a cylindrical tube that connects to overflow on this side only. It's a great, great thing. I love it. But the other side has nothing whatsoever. I just let the water flow down. It gets skimmed out by the protein skimmer and then it goes right back to the tank. And a lot of people say that this is beneficial because some uneaten food and minuscule things that we can't see, they go back into the tank, including copepods, and they feed your fish. So that's what I'm doing. It's more natural. Uh, Justin, I do ship to the UK. I do ship all around the world. The only problem is shipping to the UK is expensive. I don't make any money, like I don't raise the price at all for shipping to make any profit. I barely make profit on these things. But if you wanna instant message me your address, I'll see if I can get the price cheaper because I use those ship anywhere boxes where whatever you put in the box is a flat rate shipping. And I think that's a little more pricey, so if you're interested, I will see based on your address. Don't put it in the comments, just send me a message. And I'll see if I can, if it's cheaper to ship it direct. Yeah, I know the collection cup reeks. It is so bad. It's, the, the, my collections cup, collection cups, they reek like sewer. Your nose hairs curl. So I hold my breath. <laughs> 
I have to clean the protein skimmers today. If you guys are in the Chicagoland area, if you want to swing by and help me with this tank, that'd be great. Actually, that's a good idea. I should have locals stop by, and we can chat and film and clean the tank. Or I can go over by you. We could do a, a, a live stream film thing. That, that'd be cool. Maybe I should do that if you're in the Chicagoland area. You know what? I still have to swing out to Bob and see Bob and his tank, Etcher. We should plan that. Bob is also an administrator on the uh, RouterTube forum on Facebook. Adam, I have five tangs, five tangfish, and five clowns. Amanda and Gobi hiding someplace. Uh, lawnmower, Blenny, and a fire shrimp. So. Five tangs, five clowns, ten fish, eleven if you include the algae eater, the lawnmower blunny. Justin, you're right. That is a lot of bio load. Now, I thought if I ever get a second tank and I keep this one, I know I should get a thousand gallon tank. Um. I would totally get in there with the fish and clean it with the scuba gear. That would be so awesome. If I get a larger tank, I'd like to keep the tangs together and then just have this as like coral and clownfish. Can you imagine that? I would have to like do no cleaning on here at all because there's no barely any waste from clowns. Justin asked, how do I keep all those fish and all their waste under control. It's a lot of trial and error experimenting. Um, that's how, that's what this channel is about. Experimenting and reporting to you guys what works and what doesn't. And I've been pretty successful. They're all calm and gentle. Um, but I think one thing that's huge for me is the two protein skimmers that's pulling the sludge out in the first place. And I'm not using any media to filter this tank. There's nothing in the sump. There's no filter flush, there's no sponges, there's nothing. That way the food keeps going through. And plus, let's face it, if you got sponges and stuff and floss in your tank, people complain about canister filters as an example. Well, if you don't clean the stuff, it's going to collect all the waste. And all that waste is going to break down. That's another reason I completely hate sump socks. All the waste, think about it, all the waste filters through into the sump sock. The waste sticks to the sump so sock. It sits in your water column in the sump sock, infecting your water column, and this stuff is still breaking down in your water column. That's one reason why I designed the rotter tube. The rotter tube sits out of your water column, water flows through it, everything gets caught up in it, and then it flows out of the rot rotter tube into the sump. You know, I really love my 125-gallon tank. I think I might want to get a larger one if ever I get the money. Like a 265 would be good. But my next tank has got to be 8 feet long. I will never I will never have anything shorter than 6 feet. This is 6 feet long. I'm not a fan of tall tanks because, for one, they're hard to clean. You can reach down in there. For two, the fish generally don't swim up and down. They swim left to right. So I'd want to have an 8-foot tank to give them more swimming space. Yeah, 10-foot long would be sweet. I don't have the cash. I don't even have the cash for a 265. Like a lot of you guys, I'm broke. That's really good. So for having no... Filtration media, except for the router tube. I got crystal clear water. No bubbles. I don't have anything to clean. Detritus and fish waste and uneaten food doesn't get trapped in the sponges and the filter media. Yeah, Justin. Yeah, the saltwater hobby is expensive. 
And don't believe that you have to buy everything that's really expensive. A lot of these guys, they've either got money or maybe those with YouTube channels have endorsements. You don't need to spend a lot of money doing this. Most of my stuff is inexpensive. Like, I got this tea lighting fixture off Amazon. Not expensive at all. I think it's 120 bucks. Yeah, that's a lot of money, but LED lights are, what, $400 for one? And I need three. Screw that. I love LED, but it's too much money, man. And I was tempted to get a used tank off Craigslist or somewhere, but that freaks me out. What if there's a little leak the guy doesn't know about? I don't know. And you guys have suggestions for tank places that are really good but not expensive. Let me know. I'd rather have glass than uh, acrylic because acrylic scratches but glass is heavier. Yeah, with corals, it's always expensive. That's another reason I'm not big into corals. I love them, but I love my fish more. Corals, for me, are icing on the cake. I don't know if I'd trust myself to build a tank. Um, corals are the icing on the cake. They just add a little bit of color and pop and movement flow to my tank. That's all they do for me. Plus, they're expensive. I like my fish more. Luckily, that's how it is for me, or else I'd go really broke really fast. Yeah, that's a good question. In a sump, how come people use a lot of things? It's a lot of electricity. Yeah, people use reactors. Um, yeah, it's expensive. That's just what they do. They like to dose things in their tank. They like to have media reactors. and um, They dose things. And It's just not me. It's not my way. I just rely on biology and Mother Nature and water changes to replenish what's needed in the water. It's my way, and it's working out. You know, I know that in nature, the ocean's a huge place, and God allows for things to work out, like, you know, killing the ammonia and the bacteria. Everything works in harmony as one. Well, when they're in a glass box, the ammonia and the fish waste gets out of control, so you have to take it out of the water by skimming, and then you got to redose the calcium... Yes, that's true, Justin. But because they're trapped in a glass box, um, you got to clean up after them. Johnny Ringo, I love that name, Johnny Ringo. It's like, it's like a, it's just like a cool guy, you know, Johnny Ringo. Johnny says that he's been running really low tech with his aquarium for three years, and it's running great. And I've been, doing, I've been doing a lot of reading. And I, I, I see people, they use no sump socks, no filter floss or sponges to catch things. And I thought, man, I'll never do that. Because I would see the nasty stuff in the solids that the sump socks pull out of the water. And if you use sump socks, and most of you do, you see how nasty and filthy they are. It's like, man, I don't want that in my water column. That's true. But a lot of that stuff goes back into the tank to feed your copepods and your coral. And look, my this actually looks way better in person than it does on film right now. It's crystal clear. And I'm not using anything for mechanical filtration. So I think the, ta the tank kind of takes care of itself, you know. Water changes, that's all I do. I like this. Nothing to clean, nothing to throw away. I got the rotter tube in there, like I said, to take a little bit of the solids out to catch whatever nori that goes. But to be honest, I'd rather have that nori go through into the tank to feed the corals and the fish again. But there's nothing sitting on any media to break down. So those, it just keeps flowing through the tank and gets caught up by the protein skimmer. And that's the way to do it. Remove it from your water column. Yeah, it is sad that angelfish are not reef safe. They're very pretty. 
Um, yes, I upgraded from a LED cheap light to a T5. Yeah, I've seen a big difference. The lighting is stronger. The corals appreciate it. It's nicer to look at, and it's cheaper. Yep, a Fosban reactor. You know, that's what I would get is a Fosban reactor. I do have a reactor downstairs I might put Fosban in. That would take care of the phosphates in my water. That's going to be my next step to try that um, if the phosphates don't get under control. But my algae problem has gone down. I'm going to have to test. I have not tested my phosphates. I have to do that. Phosphates, kids, are the result of, you know, waste breaking down in the water from fish going to the bathroom and overfeeding oh i wanted to say too you know what i've been doing kind of accidentally is i've i okay i was feeding my guys once a day at night right i feed them a sheet of the nori or the bok choy that i get from the grocery store and that's it and then i feed a little bit of pellet food for the clowns and that's it but mostly what I feed is the nori sheet, half a sheet for the, the fish, to a sheet a day, the tangs. And then I feed a little piece of frozen food for the tangs, Rod's food, frozen food, and the clowns. But you know what I've been doing? Instead of feeding once a day, I'm feeding once every two days. I know that sounds cruel, but you know what? They're fine. We all feel sorry for our fish. I'm feeding once every two days. So like I did not feed them last night. I fed them a little bit now in the beginning of this video. And then I'm going to feed them uh, a little bit tonight. I will not feed them tomorrow, Sunday night. I'll feed them again Monday. So I do standard feeding every other day, once a day. I know that might sound cruel. But they're totally fine and they don't go looking all over the tank when i sit in front of it looking for food they're not starving they're gentle just like right now yeah johnny right they're look at them they're swimming they're healthy you know i feed them once every other day it's going to cut down on the fish waste it's going to cut down on the fish food in the tank um it's working out great it's working out great so in essence, I've cut down half the problem of the phosphate control, if you will. Uh, no starfish. That's what I want. I used to have a sand sifter, and he died. I, I have not found him, and I've gone through the sand with a stick gently, and I can't find him anywhere. And someone asked, how do I get the purple rock? That's coralline algae. It's a form of algae, and you get that from bringing it into your tank. So I bought one small rock, live rock, long ago, and it spread to my tank. It used to be a lot better than what it is now, but the little tiny white starfish killed it. They drilled through your coral and they drilled through your rock and it killed my coralline algae. Once you get the purple rock, the way to keep it going is to scrape it off your walls and your glass and keep your um, calcium level at 500 to 550, that's what does it for me because coralline algae really needs a lot of calcium in the water. I don't add calcium because the Red Sea Coral Pro takes care of all that for me. Such a great salt. Instant Ocean is great, but I, I love the Coral Pro. Well, looks like I've been talking for 70 minutes. I can't believe I've been talking for 70 minutes. But I'm going to get going here in a couple minutes because I do want to hang out with everybody here. <clears throat> and I want to <coughs> clean the tank. <coughs> so thanks, you guys, for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe. Give the video a thumbs up. Comment in the video comments. Let me know how you got started in the hobby and what you do for filtration. I'll be talking about more of what I do and how it affects my tank in videos to come every Saturday. I appreciate all you guys. CJ, thanks for stopping by. We got to do another <clears throat> Skype session.
and Scott, Mile High Reefers, we have to do another reef talk very soon. Thanks, Rob. Good to see you. Oh, nice hair. Hey, thanks, Gary. That means a lot. 590 calcium is a little high. If you're dosing, maybe cut back a little bit. But every, if everything looks good and your levels are fine, don't change it. You know, what's good for your tank won't be good for someone else's. Everyone's tank is different. My tank is thriving the way I do things. Trial and error. Rob, that's fine. You know what? When Scott and I were doing Reef Talk, we asked a bunch of people if they want to be on Reef Talk show, and we got some yeses, and a lot of people were excited, and then people just bailed out. So long story short, we stopped trying after a while because, you know, getting schedules together, it's, 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 a, lot of, uh, it's a lot of work. But we can certainly do those once in a while. Yes, and saltwater tanks, Justin, <clears throat> consistency is the key. Um, water changes once a week. I'm going to go out and get a, a large, uh, one of those 20-gallon Rubbermaid containers. I have one, but I drilled it a little too low. So I want to drill it at the very top. So when I make my water, I'm using the full 20 gallons. I'd like to do a 20 gallon water change instead of this 10 every week. I got to do that. I drilled it too low. I'll probably go out later to Home Depot and get another one. All right, guys, I'm going to take off because I want to clean this tank and I got to do some other stuff. I really love hanging out with you guys. Thank you so much. I look forward to these Saturday talks and I went off. Just kind of talking and chatting with you guys. Nothing in particular on this video, but it's like more of like a radio type show thing. Take care. And yeah, my tank is low tech. More on that to come. I'm going to do more of a set video on, on what I'm doing. But yeah, no mechanical filtration on this guy. You're welcome, Gary. I will see you guys later. Don't forget to join the Facebook group, everybody. Check the video description link below. Have a great weekend.